You know, Sheikh, subhanAllah, yeah, the Dawah. Yeah, we had a we had the story of a of a, a new Muslim, someone who took accepted Islam, subhanAllah. And um sad story actually. He uh, he accepted Islam, Allahu Akbar. And then he had this niggling thing in his mind because his hobby was to do sculpting. Mm. You know, sculpting over yeah, yeah, yeah. live animals, human beings, right. that kind of objects. And he obviously read somewhere that in Islam this might be a problem. Okay. So he went to the Shaykh who gave him his shahada. Mm. And he said to him, said, oh, Shaykh, um, am I, can I do this? Mm. I'm doing, this is my thing. Mm. And like, and this is my, my life. I do mm. this, my art, this is my everything. Mm. And the Sheikh tries to say, don't worry, don't worry, leave this topic. This is your new, you've got bigger things to think about, yeah, more basic things to study. Excellent. Yeah, don't worry about that. But he couldn't leave it. It wouldn't leave his head. He left, mm. he, he left dissatisfied with that answer. And then, subhanAllah, in the end, it went through his head so much, he eventually said to himself, he left his own. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. So for him, he was struggling to get his head around the grasp yeah. of being a sinning Muslim as we all are. It's better than having no Islam of course. altogether. And this is the problem with the all or nothing approach. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, fear Allah as much as you can. This is a savior of a principle. And this Quranic principle is in fact a refutation to the perfectionist fallacy. The idea that a perfect solution exists and that you should keep searching for it before taking action. This is a totally illogical hindrance to your happiness and to your success, as we saw in the example which Mahmoud shared with us. Instead, the Quran reminds man that perfection is a divine quality exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no matter how hard a person may try, he can never give his Lord his full views, even if he is operating at his maximum capacity as a worshiper of Allah. Allah said, Kalla lamma yaqdi ma amara. No man has not yet accomplished God's commands. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would stress the exact same meaning, saying, فَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَجِتَنِبُوهُ وَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِأَمْرٍ فَأْتُ مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ That if I prohibit you from something, then stay away from it. But when I command you to do something, do as much as you can from it. So due to these evidences and others, the scholars of Islam deduced fiqhi maxims, legal maxims. Like what? They say, Necessities permit the impermissible. They have a second maxim, which is, Whatever cannot be avoided is pardoned in the sharia. A third maxim, لا واجب مع العجز ولا حرام مع الضرورة. There is no obligation with inability, just as there is no impermissibility with necessity. So the application, of course, of these maxims are not left for the uh, judgment of the average Muslim, but the point of sharing them with you is to display the compassionate and fluid nature of our Islamic religion, one that is so sympathetic to our weak nature. And I want to give you examples of these fiqhi maxims in application. Fear Allah as much as you can. Wudu, we carry out with what? With water. If that is not possible, then you have tayammum, dry ablution using clean soil as an option. Fear Allah as much as you can. The obligatory salah is to be carried out in a standing posture. If that is not possible, then one is to pray, sitting down, if need be, lying down. Fasting is an obligation in Ramadan. Those who are ill, however, can break their fasts, make them up on other days. Those who are chronically ill, they feed a poor person for each day of fasting missed. Um, Hajj is an obligation upon every Muslim. But that's only if you are what? Financially and physically able. If you are compromised, that obligation falls until your circumstance changes. Enjoining good and forbidding evil. That is to be done physically. Evil is to be changed physically for those in authority. If you can't, you change it verbally. If you can't, you change it internally by detesting it. So this amazing principle of fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can is amazing. 
the application is wide, and it's not just useful in the fiqhi legal discussion, mm -hmm. but also in the day-to-day -day struggles of Muslims. Fear Allah as much as you can. It gives solace, comfort to so many different types of people. It gives solace to the newly practicing Muslim. You're going to come across huge amounts of information and instru instructions to do and abstain from things. And this principle tells you slow down, take it one step at a time, limit your source of information for now, fear Allah as much as you can. It gives comfort also to the active Muslim who feels like he or she, they just want to do it all and dip into every Islamic project that comes their way. This principle says to you, wait, hold on, be focused, be well-defined. And to set yourself targets that are ambitious but realistic. Fear Allah as much as you can. This principle also gives comfort to the student of knowledge who feels overwhelmed by the mission ahead. This principle reminds him or her that a premature dive in the deep end will end up drowning him and that knowledge is an endless shore. So fear Allah as much as you can. This principle also gives comfort to the callers to Islam so that they are not dissuaded from their path because of the prevalence and the variety of sins that are out there. They feel so outvoted. This principle reminds them that even prophets did not uproot every iota of evil. What they did do, however, was that they feared Allah as much as they could. This principle also gives comfort to those unable to apply every aspect of Islam for whatever socio-political reason. This principle reassures them to move away from that tendency of dropping it all because Islam teaches us that what cannot be attained in its entirety should not be dropped in its entirety. And I want to share with you now a few examples of doing what you can, fearing Allah as much as you can in the past and present. The first is an example pertaining to da'wah. When he was imprisoned, Prophet Yusuf found himself unable to discharge his duty of inviting his entire community to Islam. So what did he do? He feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as he could. And within the confines of prison, he became active and invited his cellmates to Islam. A second example pertains to the hijab. This noble act of worship has unfortunately been outlawed in certain places of the world. And seeing that relocation for some is not possible, and also day-to-day -day necessities means that <coughs> avoiding the public sphere is also difficult, such women would be advised, generally speaking, to, address, to dress as near as they can to the Islamic hijab, and above all, to fear Allah as much as they can. A third example is the Friday prayer. al buwaiti the Shafi'i jurist, was imprisoned. So on every Friday, he would bathe, apply his fragrance, and when hearing the call to the prayer from within the cell, would walk toward the prison door. He knows that he's not going anywhere. Prison guard would say to him, may Allah have mercy on you. Where are you going? He said, I'm going to respond to the call of my Lord. The guard would say to him, may Allah have mercy upon you. Please go back. So al Buwaiti would walk back to his cell and he will say, Allahumma inni ajabtu da'iq famana'uni. Oh Allah, I tried responding to your caller, but they prevented me. He did this every Friday despite knowing the outcome. But what did he do? He wanted to show Allah this principle in action. I'm fearing you, my Lord, as much as I can. A fourth example is governance. Many assume that just because you are in a position of power, right? Reformation and change is as simple as the clicking of a button or the pulling of a lever. No, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Even those in power are bound by the same rule that says fear Allah as much as you can. And a fine example of this, again, is Prophet Yusuf. He was appointed as treasurer of Egypt. That's a position of power. But the country, the king of that country and the community, don't forget, they weren't Muslims. So commenting on this, Imam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, it is well known that because of their kufr, their faithlessness, they inevitably had certain customs of reaping money in haram ways and spending it for the benefit of the king, king's associates and his family and soldiers and community, as opposed to spending that money in accordance to the, accordance to the prophetic way of justice. Mm. Yusuf, he says, ibn Taymiyyah, 
Yusuf, however, was not able to do all what he wanted according to the religion of Allah because his people would not comply with him. However, he did what he could in upholding justice and goodness. And then he says, وَهَذَا كُلُّهُ دَاخِلٌ فِي قَوْلِهِ فَاتَّقُ اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And all of this comes under the umbrella of fear Allah as much as you can. Another amazing example of this is An-Najashi, the Negus Abyssinian king who embraced Islam secretly at the time of Prophet Muhammad He found himself unable to govern according to the dictates of Islam. And commenting on this, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that An-Najashi was not able to govern according to the Quran because his people la ala ذلك, they would have disapproved. Ibn Taymiyyah then said, it often happened when a person would find himself needing to act as a judge between the Muslims and the Mongols, and even as an imam. And his desire was to uphold a particular element of justice, but was not able to do so. In fact, he is prevented from doing so, and Allah, he says, does not burden a person beyond his scope. See, I just want to pause here for a second and show you, had these examples existed today, Many people will be giving them the red card straight away. Kafir, you're not applying the religion of Allah. Sometimes it's not as simple as that. And they really are behind closed doors trying to fear Allah as much as they can. So think best of those, especially those who display that which is good. So back to An-Najashi, the Negus king, whom we said was not able to apply all of the elements of Islam. In fact, his people thought he was a Christian. So maybe he was reading from the... Psalms or the Gospels, and he was perhaps wearing a cross, but that's what he could do. Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, and Najashi and his likes, despite this, they are blissful people in Jannah. Despite the fact that they had not applied the laws of Islam that they were uh, unable to apply. Rather, they would govern according to what they were able to govern with. So in reality, the manifestations of this principle are infinite, which displays the immensely compassionate and pragmatic nature of our religion. And whilst Islam does not expect perfection, it does expect a human effort towards perfection. Mm -hmm. Whilst acknowledging that we will never reach it, as the Prophet wasallam said, come as close as you can to righteousness, but realize you'll never attain it. Or come as close as you can to righteousness, but you will never attain perfection. Powerful obsessions like perfectionism can stop us from even starting, stop us from, from progressing, and equally important, stop us from finishing. The reality is that we cannot pursue an endeavor without some sort of imperfection. And so when your perfectionist tendencies begin to surge, tame them, with this principle of فتقوا ما استطعتم فير الله as much as you can. وبالحق أنزلناه وبالحق نزل وما أرسلناك إلا مبشرا ونذيرا وقرآنا فرقناه لتقرأه على الناس على مكث ونزلناه تنزيلا